notice that this lowly servant has made a right. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be serious, go. Okay. Okay. Let me see. It doesn't help. <laughs> spoke about money all the time. One in seven verses in Luke's gospel is about money and wealth. After the kingdom of God, this is the most spoken about subject. I've been working on a theology of money and debt-based interest for, for a number of years. In fact, I even made a film about it. And so let's go to the film uh, to get the reading from, from Matthew and Luke combined. Okay, watch this. The parable of the talents. A rich ruler left three servants in charge of his kingdom. To the first, he gave ten talents, the second, five, and the third, one. When that lord returned, the first servant said, Look, I have made ten more. Well done, good and faithful servant. The second said, Look, I have made five more. Well done, good and faithful servant. The third servant said, I knew you were a hard man, that you reaped where you did not sow. I placed the talent in the ground. Here, what is yours, I return to you. You unfaithful wretch. You knew I was a hard man, that I reaped where I did not sow. Why did you not at least bank the money for the interest? Take all he has and give it to my faithful servants. And they cast him out into the outer darkness where there was misery and gnashing of teeth. We all have talents. I even have a talent for a name. Over the next few weeks, we are going to be putting scripture into practice. Each of us will take 10 pounds. I grew up in church and loved church even as a little girl. And I heard many sermons on Luke 19 or Matthew 25 the parable of the talents. Because today, it's not only Valentine's Day, but also Racial Justice Sunday. So Kevin and I decided to go out into the snow and demonstrate just how this parable has been whitewashed. So today we're going to look at the parable of the talents. And one interpretation of it is that God, in God's wisdom, has given us many gifts and we use those gifts for the kingdom, to grow the kingdom. So the, the person that was given more talents is because God trusted them with more responsibility. And so they were given this money and God just knew because they were trustworthy and they were obviously good at what they do, that they would make even more out of the money. Amazing. And then God, you know, those that aren't so able, well, just a little bit less. But God knowing that they would make abundance out of what they were given. And they did. And then the one takes it, does nothing with it. I mean, what's that saying? That they've got no sense of responsibility. That God has given these them gifts and they've just thrown them away like they're not important. And then buries them in the ground and nothing comes of it. Well, no wonder there was gnashing of teeth in uh, hell. Because really, if God's given you this gift and you've done nothing but squander it. So the interpretation really is, oh, good on you. More talents, more gifts, and uh, more for the kingdom of God. And those, not so much, didn't try that hard. Well, sorry, out of darkness, God's going to send you there. Sorry about that, but that's just the way it is. Amen. Amen. Even if you Google parable of the talents, meaning you will, nine times out of ten, get the interpretation Nadine has just shared with you. So, two questions face us today. One, why is that exegesis just plain rubbish? And two, why does the Western Protestant Church keep on teaching that? First of all, 
Let's be clear, the term talent does not in the original text refer to my beautiful singing voice or Kevin's ability to play the piano and lead worship, but actually talent means money. <laughs> and lots of it. Like in the annual salary of a high paying London stockbroker, it's millions or even more. So Jesus was a brilliant storyteller. And like any good storyteller, Jesus exaggerates and lampoons here just a little bit to make dramatic effect. A powerful king goes away and leaves a humongous amount of money for the first servant. Ten million pounds and five million pounds for the second servant. It's about a lot of money. Okay, so who's this powerful man with all of the money? If we don't understand the context, we may misunderstand the parable from right from the beginning. In chapter 19, Luke tells us that this powerful man goes off to a distant country to gain for himself a kingdom. Well, Jesus' listeners would have known immediately who he is talking about. It was, <laughs> it was Herod uh, who actually did go off to Rome to get favor with Caesar to gain the title of King of the Jews. Right from the beginning, the listeners understand that we're not talking about God, but about empire. So now we find ourselves being carried along in the story. The first servant is boastful and proud and makes an extraordinary claim. He has converted his 10 million pounds into 100 million pounds. And the second servant has converted his five million pounds into 50 million pounds. It's a huge amount of money. So just a minute now, what is Jesus saying? We must realize that these increases are practically impossible. Jesus' listeners are some of the poorest and the most taxed people in the empire. They immediately understood that there was no way to make that level of economic growth unless it was through exploitation or theft. This money is profit made off the backs of the poorest of the poor. At last, we come to the final oh, servant. <laughs> In traditional interpretations, this poor servant acts as the villain of the piece. Her refusal to use her talents for the benefit of the community is used as a warning against those congregation members who are lazy or lack enthusiasm. But let's look a little closer at what the servant actually says. I knew you were a hard man, that you reaped where you did not sow. So I buried the money in the ground and look, it didn't grow. Here you can imagine the farmers in Jesus' audience practically rolling with laughter. You can see the third servant is not only refusing to participate in the exploitative economics of empire that has only increased through exploitation, but she even starts to lampoon Herod. You see, King Herod, I took your money and I sowed it in the soil and look, it didn't grow. Look, well, so sorry, you have nothing to reap here because if this money were truly of God, it would grow. It would follow God's economy of abundance and sharing. So Herod is furious. He knows. <laughs> You're reading along with me. <laughs> like a bad actor, you know? Yeah. Reading other people's lines. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so. Herod is furious. He knows that the slowly servant has made a right fool of him in front of everybody. Just like Jarrell Robinson Brown, the servant has torn aside the propaganda of the empire for all to see and so must be punished. So Jesus offers a warning to all his disciples who go up against empire. If you go up against empire, you will be cast out into the darkness. And here we hear echoes of Jesus asking us to pick up our cross and to follow him. Well, we've got to the end of our story now, but I left with the question of why the Western church has for so long ignored this interpretation of the parable in favor of one where the rich man is cast in the role of God. 
And that third servant is always cast as the villain instead of the hero. So Seattle-based theologian Wes Howard Brook talks about the term ecclesia, which is in English translated as church. But in fact, it means to come out. The church is that body of people that has come out of Herod's system of empire. Unfortunately, he says, the church has shifted from coming out of empire to what he terms baptizing empire. Christianity has become, by and large, the religion of empire. And if you are the religion of empire, well, then you need to find a way of justifying empire systems, you see. So the rich man in the story, instead of being Herod, now becomes God. And the, ser the third servant, instead of being the hero of the story, becomes the villain. villain. If you want to hear more from his, Wes himself, he will be joining Chinny MacDonald and William Young for an online Easter festival called Yours in the Uprising of Jesus, Recognizing and Resisting Empire. We do hope to see you there. Well, we are left with just one question. How does this parable relate to money too tight to mention? Well, that is because the monetary system imposes an artificial scarcity onto God's abundance. Mm. That is why you have mountains of food going to rot. That is why you have homeless people sleeping rough in cities where there are thousands of properties with absent landlords. Artificial scarcity, money too tight to mention for those who are cast into the outer darkness where there's gnashing of teeth. On that somber note, we'll leave you, but do look up the festival to learn more. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Amen. Amen. Okay. Both of us say that. No, no, Amen. let's do it. Okay. Okay. okay.